I go live, go live. We shall go live. We shall go live two hundred and twenty three years ago. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? And please do notice, yes, I've got some lovely new graphics from the wonderful Brian, who has done, has produced put these together. I'm not sure how they he produces them quite so quickly, but they have come. It has come through. I've got some major cell graphics, and they're lovely. And you're probably going to be seeing more of them. And yes, how to lose frigates and influence is live now. I planned this for the 18th of June. Absolutely ages ago, not realizing what a date it was. So I'm going to say this now. If people end up popping off and feeling torn between myself and my good colleague, Drakinafel, I don't mind. I love you all, and I am very glad when you're here. But I also know that a live, especially after he's just come back from a trip, is going to involve a lot of hats, and people are going to want to be there. So if you want to go, that is fine. Now, that is not just fine, that's encouraged. Go have fun. But I'm going to be doing this live because I promised to do this live on the 18th of June a long time ago, mainly because this is one of those actions which is quite so important for especially a lot of the things I'm discussed when I'm teaching and yet gets quite so forgotten because there aren't many actions where your entire, your entire opponent's fleet are wiped out. And in this case, are captured entirely. The whole lot. Every single one of them. All five. Five for five. Gone. And that's a big thing. That's a lot of fun to talk about, but it is a big thing. So, hello everyone. Now, firstly, I also have to get some iron brew out. Now, I have a really quite a big glass, a uh, 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 bottle, but let's see, can I get the entire Let's see how much of the bottle fits in the glass. Scared of me from a Waterloo. No, not at all. Hello, everyone. Um, also, I should probably admit what I'm going to be up to next week. Next week, on Saturday, I'm at Chalk Valley. So if people want to see me, uh, want to uh, bump into me at all, I'm going to be wandering around Chalk Valley History Festival on Saturday. And on the Sunday, I'm going to Tank Fest! Which is going to be a lot of fun. And on Saturday night, I think I'm torturing my friends in lifeboats in a pool, but we'll leave that to one side. Mm. That's good. 1901. Right then. So. Hello, everyone. How did you do, Michelle? Happily wa and happy Waterloo Day. Mm hmm. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, DG40. Hello, Rob Smith. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello, Seneca Nero. Hello, Calvin Gunsworth. Hello, 9601. I criticised the Lutario class battleships for such poor deck armor, as Rome was only so easily destroyed with a flimsy deck being punched through. Granted, Warcork, you took a direct hit and shrugged it off. Um, you also have to remember there's the placing because where you have your deck armor and this is one of the things that I get into discussions with people about armor. Um, they often get people always turn around and go through. Well, if it's a solid piece of armor, it's best. That's true. But if you're doing a lot of solid plates and they're all that thickness, then there are going to be gaps between those plates. You you might try and angle it and various other things you can do to try and make the joins less able to be easily penetrated, but they're all quite complex, especially with the curving nature of a hull. Almost easier to divide the thickness in half and do that with the plates, kind of like overlapping Legos or bricks. People will turn around and go, well, then it's not going to be as strong as it could be thickness-wise in terms of resisting. Yes. But the... 
gaps are gonna, aren't going to be as much of a problem, and the gaps basically beca can become major problems. Um, witness what I was managing to do in the axe throwing uh, in the axe throwing recently, which we talked about on um, Twitter with hashtag Naval History Can Twenty Two. Uh, you can see us chucking axe, and I kept making the great thing of managing to get my axe to land so it slotted between two pieces of wood. So it went really deep and was really fun to pull out, but it went really deep into the wood. Which was fun, and not really what it was supposed to do. The fact it wasn't scoring me any points when it did that, I felt, you know, I got no marks for pre uh, for penetration. I felt I should be getting marks for the fact that if the axe had been stuck in a human like that, they would have been gone. But no, because it wasn't anywhere near the, 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 the little, you know, the dot in the middle. I would have taken off their head if I'd been aiming to send her a mass, though. Hmm. Ah, well. There's no appreciation for... Penetration. Uh. <laughs> so does the difference in frigates increase by 10 hours as well? Yep. <laughs> so I should have No, the Imperial Emperor is going down faster than the Imperial Guardsman Waterloo. That is the thing about... Um, to be fair, I filled up the glass, and that's how much is left in the bottle. So basically, it's a glass full. So this should probably be drunk in sherry glasses. Colonel Cameron, that's a thought. Do we know which ship the colours were to be sent for, to for return to the UK when they removed them from the regiment to Waterloo? Uh, basically, they were to go to a port and find the first ship ready to sail, I think. If they had to remove them at speed. So, hello everyone, and this is the action of the 18th June, 1799. This is all about frigates. This is all about what happens when you lose the little your little ships of war. And there are some real problems here, because we talk a lot, and you know, that there are a lot of jokes made about the French Navy in the Napoleonic era. And this is one of the Brian's new pictures he's done for me. There is a lot of discussion we have about the Napoleonic Navy and the fact that in Napoleon's Navy, the charts were so few and so, the, the British charts were considered so superior that they offered more money for if you capture the, uh, much more money for if you capture a ship with charts intact than if you capture just an enemy ship. Well, one of the things I have to get asked by people is go, well, why didn't the French have their own charts? And one of the reasons why the French charting isn't done as much as it could be is because they lack the frigates. Let's be honest, frigates and small ships are the things which would most likely sneak out and get through a blockade. There's a great debate going on. Well, are they faster than the ships of the line? Now, the ships of the line usually can put a crowd on more sail in terms of square area because they have square footage of sail. However, frigates tend to be a lot lighter and narrower. So, and as we all know, speed is a function of length to width. In many cases, with a, with a ship design. So if you're longer, thinner, in terms of your, uh, the ratio, uh, that can affect your speed. There's also coming out soon a um, review of Glyn Stewart's um, Nine Sail Star, which is also going to be in tomorrow's Brew Ships, because it's a really cracking read. It's currently open for Kickstarter now. I'm quite happily singing its praises to everyone. And this is not he, He's done me too. Really, really cool. All right, so... It takes place in 1799, which, believe it or not, is not Napoleon Wars. Technically, it's the French Revolutionary Wars. It's te technically the War of the Second Coalition. And it is after the Battle of the Nile. 
So it's when the French are pretty much down to a frigate only force in the Mediterranean. And frigates are really, really important. And they don't have enough of them. And now they're going to lose a whole bunch of them. And that is pretty much your starting for start of a 10 of what your problem is for the French at this particular point. They're going to lose ships and they're going to lose a lot more ships. You know, uh, that is what you don't want them to do. And you don't want to do if you're the French. You don't want to lose ships. But the French were never particularly good at... And this is going to turn to change. They get progressively worse. And I discussed this in the Long Patrol, but I'll be talking about this again at length. In terms of their fleet management. Because of... The repeated losses. You, know, you can't keep losing officers, NCOs, sailors at the rate they were and rebuild your force and recapitalize your force if you keep uh, wanting to do operations. Because there's, who's going to train them? Who's going to train your people? Um, it was, let's see... Yeah, it was between... Yeah. It was about... 50 years before this. That you start getting the Huguenots and various other groups being purged from the French Navy. And at that time, not only is one of the most senior officers in the French Navy who isn't purged, you must remember, from the Navy... But is Huguenot, is Protestant. But roughly a third of the French Navy is Protestant. Okay? Roughly a third of their officers. It had been considered a safe, viable career. They didn't really like them in the army. Them serving in the Navy was considered fine. You know, they're off at sea. They're not causing any trouble. They're amongst their own kind. And they do, they've got a, they do duty. Oh, and... Plus that, if they're going to be winding and uh, annoying people up in America, in, uh, the British up in Americas and various other places like that, the fact that they're fellow Protestants does actually assist. It causes things to be safer. But they are always another, and then they are purged. And then you start off with the various wars the French started going. And this is why in the American Revolutionary War, War of Independence, the French Navy, uh, around that period, the French Navy is pretty darn good. They do a lot of very interesting, very good operations. Because they've still got roughly two-thirds of their force, all that senior officers. But then they start to lose them. In a few, losing a few crucial battles, you lose a few cr critical senior officers, etc., and then you just keep going on with that cycle. The Revolutionary Wars are revolutionary in many ways because, you know, France is going through this period of we don't have a monarch, and eventually they're going to have Nap Napoleon, who will be a monarch in everything but, but name. After all, he's the emperor. They are going to go through this period, but that causes them again to lose a lot of officers and lose a lot of NCOs. And one of the interesting things is when I talk to people, they go, well, why were they losing NCOs as well? Why were they, you know, surely they'd been promoting them to take up. Well, the, the trouble is some of the NCOs go off and become army officers because there's far more rapid promotion there. But also some of the NCOs didn't like the new officers they were getting. In the nicest way, they were looking at some of the officers they were getting and going, ah, that guy's going to get me killed. 
And remember, your NCOs usually are smart, and they're able to get out of the way. Now, the Huguenots go to Prussia, they also go to the UK, and that explain that also helps the Royal Navy, by the way. The Royal Navy gets a huge number of Huguenots. Uh, they also go to Russia, they go to Sweden. Basically, any major power which wants their navy boosted goes, looks around the French and goes, You guys are twonkers, right? These are some really good officers, and you're just, with years of experience. They've been the ones who've been volunteering for the most arduous, longest range duties, the ones which have been absolutely nightmares to do. They're the, you're some of your most experienced, and best, and most capable officers, and you're getting rid of them. Because you don't like their religion? Well, if you don't want to, we're happy to accommodate them. Hello, many 6040. Nice to hear an age of sail ship name you'd want you to reuse on a modern set of warship. Uh... I could have real fun with ships called Barks. Dear Jenna, I'm currently reading the Aubrey Mauritius Command novel. Great fun. Four forty gun French frigates breaking up head to Mauritius. Yeah, actually happened. Which is fun. But they keep pushing. They keep trying to push their fleet out there. And this is the other problem. You're try you want your fleet to do all, your du all the duties still, but you don't give it time to recover. Now, here is, of course, the French Revolutionary Wars. And specifically, the Mediterranean Campaign of 1798, because which this, uh, this battle, Mars is being in... June 1799 is really the tail end of. The French are doing well on land. In fact, they do very well on land. They do so well on land that a gentleman named Napoleon decides to go off to Egypt. Oh, okay, so here is the thing. You have all the abilities to, to do strategic maneuver that you do. Napoleon manages, in the fleet he's in, to break out, to go to Malta, to go all the way across to Egypt. It's an absolutely amazing operation. And when you sort of start to think about it, people go, well, how does he do it? Well, it's because the British immediately fall back on Gibraltar the moment he's gone out of there, because to them, it's very obvious. What's the strategic key to the Mediterranean? Gibraltar. If the French take the Mediterranean, they attack Gibraltar, they turn the Mediterranean into a French lake. If the if they don't if the British continue to have Gibraltar, they continue to have as much access as they want to the Mediterranean. That is the thing. Gibraltar is this key. And yet, he goes from Malta and from there he goes to Egypt. And it's actually one of the interesting things again is Nelson manages to sail to Egypt so fast he gets there before the French do. Which leads you to a very interesting scenario. If Nelson had realised that he got there so much faster than the French, and had decided... that 
you know, I will now go back or I will wait for them to come. He, of course, goes back. But if he decided to wait for them to come, there is the interesting idea of what happens to the French fleet. Considering what happens to the Battle Nile, anyway, what happens to the French fleet if he catches all the transports and all the ships at sea fully laden? That's a whole different ball game of a battle, but he doesn't. Nelson decides to hurtle back westwards because he presumes that he's made a mistake after finding they taken Malta, that they, he'd made a mistake, that they weren't going to Egypt, that they're actually, they were going to double back, that Malta was the bluff to draw them into the eastern Mediterranean, to draw them away from the, uh, Gibraltar, and that now, uh, with Malta secured, the French were going to double back and take Malta. Because Napoleon is already considered a bit of a bogeyman. Okay, he's already considered a name. His army is considered an impressive force. He is considered an artillery specialist. He's a bit of a siege specialist as well at this point. So, on paper, he is the perfect person with the perfect army to go and take Gibraltar. And I know there's the glorious thing he does with taking all the academics and everything, etc. with him to go to... Egypt and establish Egyptology and all the other things he does, and that's that's lovely. It's always nice when you go and establish another field of history and archaeology. We we don't mind. We're a very encompassing group. Uh, we like to broaden our horizons, and we always feel more things should be under our broad strokes umbrella. Trust me, there are various colleagues in the engineering department I work in who are fairly certain that the historian is trying to take it all over. I have told them that's not true while sitting there reading a copy of Machiavelli in the middle of a staff meeting in front of them. Keep Always good to keep your colleagues on their toes. Just keep them a little bit on their toes. Anyway. So he's sailing... Nelson's sailing backwards and forwards. Napoleon managed to get around. He lands in Egypt. Well, hey, he's doing his whole Egyptian land campaign, which if people are very interested in, at some point I will do a video about, because... Some of the riverine stuff they get up to is really quite cool. But really, Malta is the high point from a naval perspective. And the fact that they make it to Egypt. But there's a trouble when you do make it to Egypt. Because what happens? Well, the Battle of Nile happens. And the Battle of Nile is as close to annihilation as you would can get, really, in this scenario. And what does that mean? That means that the scariest, most capable most supported army that the French have in the Mediterranean is now the other end of the Mediterranean from the only really pe a real piece of strategic uh, real estate which the British are absolutely obsessed with maintaining control over. Everything else can come and go. They will let it go, come, whatever happens. They don't really care. But Gibraltar is what they're obsessed with. And... <clears throat> This is the other point which it's worthwhile thinking about. Because that's, of course, 1798. And the great siege of Gibraltar had ended in 1783. So 15 years earlier, there had been a great Franco-Spanish siege of Gibraltar. And in this coalition, the French and the Spanish were, were allied again. So, again, it's no surprising that the British were expecting a sea an attack on Gibraltar. And again, you've brought Napoleon. You've got a big army. You've gone to Egypt? Why? We're going to get to India. Okay, right. So, either you're planning on repeating the feat of Alexander the Great and crossing for uh, going up through Asia Minor the Middle East, and across, and then into India that way. Which is a lovely idea. There are a few other empires that will get in your way. The Ottomans, for one. Which you might win against, you might not, but it's not going to be a fun time fighting them all. And you've also sort of made your journey. Or what are you trying to do? Fight your way through Egypt, go to, I don't know down to sort of where modern Somali areas, find a fleet somehow and sail across the Indian Ocean. Again, there's a Royal Navy squadron in the Indian Ocean, which would go 
Oh, hello! You've got no frigates. You've got no sir. Uh, you, you've got no ships at the line. Yes, there's a small French squadron wandering around. But this is kind of turning up into an Armada scenario where your fleet's got to meet up with your transport fleet, which are going to be inappropriately designed vessels for what they're going to have to cross, and your whole army's coming from an entirely different direction. Oh, that's got so many issues going on. All right. So, Egypt. Nice idea on paper. Not really on paper. No, it, it's entirely a scheme which is about some, one person's ego. That's the only world that makes any strategic sense. But it does lead to the Battle of Nile, which is annihilate, annihilatory and a bit of interesting fun. In contrast to you, Jones, how are the Catholics treating British armed forces? I get the impression the known ones were okay, i.e. if your name is Howard, but the best the rest were badly treated. <sighs> Britain does, uh, the major population of Catholics the British have are the Irish. Um, at this point, the major population of Catholics. And honestly... How do I put this politely? It depends on the officers involved, but most officers are quite pragmatic. I, <laughs> uh, persecuting them sounds lovely when you are, uh, have got all these rules and regulations on the books. Actually implementing those rules and regulations and employing them against your crew, who might provide as much as a third of the, sh of the crew in your ships and might be providing a goodly number of the troops in your regiments. That's an entirely different matter. It's a case of, oh, what a lovely regulation. Oh, which, which bright spark parliamentarian got this written? Really? How kind of you. Yes. Just let me put it here, next to the fire. Oh my, did the regulation burn? Oh. Well, we'll never know what we're supposed to implement, do we? Basically, there is a long track record in the Royal Navy of and the British Armed Forces of we have these regulations on paper. Implementation of them is a completely different matter that depends on whether or not the context requires it. Hey, Doc, did you manage to get even just a little bit of a tan? Mm, yeah, I got a bit of a tan. Just a tad. It'll be gone. It'll probably be gone soon. Gibraltar is always the key. Uh, even Hitler grasped this and tried many times to get the Spanish to merely let him move German troops into attack. Franco never allowed it. Various bribes and reasons. Yeah, we, we've talked about this in the past, about um, an interesting gentleman called Canaris and the advice he gives to Franco, because that has a big factor in that. Um, how long did Nelson miss them by Egypt? By Egypt? Uh, it's There's a debate as to whether it's hours or days, but it's not long. It's not long at all. I was asking, you got your own Operation Tan? No, not quite. But no, um, it's... It's fun. Uh, I will add something else. There is going to be a review of this book coming out as a separate video for Glenn, because I did promise him one. The review is 15 minutes long. The actual video is an hour... The actual interview we did discussing it is an hour and 15 minutes long. So if um, 
you want to see the full video at some point, probably with a couple of edits. Uh, you might well want to start pestering uh, Glyn on Twitter and going, will you let Alex release it? Because you know, if Glyn would like, if Glyn agrees, I'll put it out there for everyone as a nice long in discussion of him and me basically discussing his all his books. Hello, furry kitten. So, 18th of June, 1799. So, after the Battle of the Nile, as you all know, pretty much all the ships that line in the French Navy that are in that region are no more. Oh, they're either captured, they're, uh, they're either captured, blown up, or they're currently getting back as fast as they can to France. However, some frigates are brave, and they say, under Rear Admiral Perret, come, uh, Rear Admiral Perret. Now, he's a nice gentleman. He's hardworking. Everything you really want in a Rear Admiral, or Contra Admiral, as the French would call him. There is a small problem for Napoleon. All the sailors that Nelson captures, he releases. Why? Because he doesn't want to feed them. And also because it's far more trouble for Napoleon to find a good use for them. Napoleon does try to put them to various use. They're piloting Zibex, they're galleys on Niles, they're, you know, doing work with various frigates when they're available. However, the frigates themselves are not exactly left alone. The ones that stay, some of them lose their 18-pounder guns. A lot of them use their shot. And as such, this particular force we're, talk we're going to talk about ends up taking part in the Siege of Accra. And, you know, part of the further campaign in Egypt and Syria, where you're just going for war for the sake of we want to fight in the Holy Land. Pere has a force of three frigates and two bricks. They're used to ferry supplies and artillery for the army. And they're getting through in spite of the, Brit of the Ottoman and British blockades. They're doing as well as they can be expected, mainly because those blockades are not really being strictly enforced. They're present, but they're more a case of, we're here, we're not going to let you get a lot of supplies in, but we're not going to stress ourselves by going after too much, because, um, frankly, we're at the end of our logistics line as well. The frigates were Yunon, under Commander Pokia, which also seems to be used as Perea's flagship. Uh, courageous and a Captain Trulet. Oh, food has arrived. Hello, thank you. And um, Alceste, which is under Captain Barret, and the Briggs, Salamine, under Lieutenant Landry, and Alette, under probably Lieutenant Demay. And I keep saying probably Lieutenant. Because there is a debate as to whether or not he was actually a commissioned officer. It's a small debate. Most of the sources seem to consider him to be a actual officer, so I would go with it. But there is a debate. These are the three officers who are going to involve us as the, sort of the commanders here. Uh, we have Keith, Lord Viscount, uh, Viscount Keith, who is running the blockade of Toulon. Again, people get very concentrated on Jarvis, they get concentrated on Napoleon, on Rodney. Keith is another very good admiral. Not possibly as good as Duncan, but still a, fairly good, a very good admiral and worthy of some respect. This is Jean-Baptiste Parer. He spent most of his life as a merchant sailor, a merchant officer, a merchant sailor officer, before being inducted into the navy because they were so short of officers. This is John Markham. Because he's having hard trouble getting his admirals who are supposed to be subordinate to him to actually turn up and do what they're supposed to be doing, including a certain Nelson, Horatio having at this point gone, uh, been going, ooh, pretty lady, I'm in Naples. Oh, pretty lady. Um, I'm getting a little bit distracted. So 
So he's having to use captains to do quite a lot of the running around on the small group command, but that's fine. And the really interesting forces, the reason is sort of his force, his five ships. While they're supporting the Cedar Acre, they lose 18 pounder guns. They are reduced down to just 15 shots per gun being carried, all to support the army. And then on the 14th of May, they spot two enemy ships aligned and a frigate under that wonderful gentleman known as Sir Sidney Smith. Yes, that is the Sydney of uh, if anyone's going to be a Napoleonic era 007, it will be Sydney. Um, Alexander Cochrane and the various Cochrans could be getting up to various all sorts of things, but no, if anyone is 007 in the 1700s and the the early late 1700s, early 1800s, it is Sir Sidney Smith and all the stuff he's getting up to. And they managed to elude their pursuers. Largely because those ships are some of the more interesting ships available at this point. There is including the fact that one of the ships that align with Sydney, the Royal Navy is not quite sure if it's still sailing. There are some reports it's supposed to be going through deep maintenance and it turns out to be out with the Sydney. He needs his extra ship. You are dealing with a Royal Navy, which is basically at this point going. We found an entire squadron of ships aligned down the back of the uh, down the back of the uh, back of that couch. Really, another one? Didn't we find them one last week? Yes. Who's the rear admiral in charge of this squadron? Um, one of them, I think, is a rear admiral, the Red. But we accounted for all those. No. How many rear admirals do we have now? <laughs> hmm. As you mentioned, Acre, what do you think of this new Smith? He strikes me as brilliant, but many try to knock him. He's as close to a special operations force as the Royal Navy in that region has, and various other regions after the war and during the other places. So, yeah, uh, let's just wait. He's doing a job which hasn't really been invented yet. Without the resources, that will become standard for when that job does become the case. And in a time which doesn't really recognize that role, but needs that role. So yeah, does he get everything right? No. Does he possibly have a little bit too much fun doing it? Yes. Could he have given Napoleon a strategic masterclass? More than likely. Did he sometimes... Mm, probably create more problems mid to medium and long term by doing short term expediency occasionally but the trouble is this is the realities of of the navy and the realities of the time they live in sometimes you go with what you have it's okay i have to admit i am current i am currently writing an article which is attempting to use as many of these phrases from popular fiction and science fiction as I possibly can. There's even a quote from Glynn's new book in there. And, um... Yeah. Whenever you hear the Ultramines talking about the theoretical versus the practical, Sydney is the king of doing the practical. He understands enough of the theoretical that he tries to factor it in and certainly does his best, but he is king of what is the practical solution to my current problem. How to wipe out an army without actually having to fight a battle. Take its very popular general home to France. 
and make sure he gets there so he doesn't become a martyr. Now, he managed to get him there just a little bit too late, so France had fallen into civil war by the time he got there, and then he ended up being a casualty of it. That might have been a very interesting long-term plan, but, you know... Napoleon genuinely hated Sicily, yes. But there again, so many people did genuinely hate Sicily. That is a way to judge the caliber of, a, of an officer, the, um, the number and quality of their enemies. So Sicily certainly didn't make enemies who were low level. He was far too busy pissing off their bosses. The low levels loved them because blaming their stuff on... Oh, so Sidney managed to stop that. Hmm. But these are the officers involved. Uh, Lord Keith, he's very much a veteran. Jean Pin, uh, Jean Jean Baptiste Perret. Let's see. He went to see it in seventeen. He was born in seventeen sixty one. He went to see it at the age of twelve. On the merchant vessel Glorious under his father. He rose over 20 years of experience to take part in the campaign on the fleet, which is a sort of mm, fast merchant ship, often used for pirateering, privateering in the French Royal Navy as an aid pilot and earned his commission of sea captain in 1785. In 1793, on the War of the First Coalition, uh, he's, Perret is enlisted into the Navy as an acting ensign. Um, by September, he was commanding a frigate squadron in the Western Mediterranean and took part in the very inconclusive action of the 22nd of October 1793 against then-Captain Horatio Nelson. Now, it's an inconclusive action because it is one ship at a line versus four frigates and one brig. The particular ship at a line, of course, was Agamemnon. And, uh, yeah. It's an inconclusive battle, but it's definitely one worth hmm, not as interesting as the 18th, but it, 22nd October 1793 is a cool battle to look at. This picture is the Junon, which is a pretty darn cool ship, but uh, no, we're sort of. You have some very experienced naval officers involved in this. Jean Baptiste is in many ways. The least experienced as he starts off his career in the Merchant Navy. Um, John Markham was the second son to William Markham, the Archbishop of York. And he's educated at Westminster School. In March 1775, he joined the Navy at the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War. Serves under, well, serves under Lord Keith in... HMS Romney and HMS Perseus. And he just keeps getting promoted. He is picked out very early as one of Lord Keith's personnel. A good one. He's also promoted by Sir Peter Parker. Who goes on to become Spider-Man. I mean, sorry, no. First, uh, becomes on goes on to become a baronet. And, uh, yeah. He's eventually appointed to board of Ambrosy by Earl St. Vincent, who he'd also served with in the Mediterranean, becoming first naval lord in there from January 1806. He survived in that post for over a year, promoted the vice admiral in 1809, 
and eventually promoted to full admiral in 1819. However, he never served in a command capa a cap a, a capacity after his time on the Naval Lords, mainly because people were worried about what he might actually do. No, good officer. Anyway, the Giron. Now this is a cool ship. It is. Commissioned in the French Navy under the then Captain d'Etre in 1786. She served as division flagship for the Chef d'Escadre fleet in the 12 ship Escadre, the Revolution. Uh, a squadron of warships that were supposed to be were created in peacetime for the purpose of training their crew and student officers. So it was a critical force, and it was part of their attempts to deal with the legacy of getting rid of the Huguenots. She also served as the flagship of the French division off the coast of West Africa. And, well. She provided a constant sort of career. She ferried an ambassador to Constantinople. Uh, supporting landing of French troops in Sardinia in 1793. She had a pretty good career. Right up until 1798, where she ran aground on her upon her arrival in Abakir, and then is repaired in Alexandria. She's put under command of Pourquier and became part of the force under Rear Admiral Pierre. Ferries ammunition and artillery to the French army besieging Accra. And, well, as mentioned up here, that design isn't from her time as a French ship, no. That design comes from her time when she's become known as Princess Charlotte, where she has been named. If I do not say this, basically, Lord Keith's flagship is called the Queen Charlotte, and when he finds this new ship being inducted in and he's looking at it, it's been captured by his protege. He goes, "I have to give her a new name. She will become the Princess Charlotte." Mm-hmm. Hello, Wayne's World of Science and Technology. Hello, how are you doing? Have the fleet of flight research assistants got over their insecurities over their treat source? Not quite yet. So anyway, is it true the British sailors are called Napoleon Boney, like in the Hornblower books? Yes, and many, many other far ruder things. So, you know, why does every century in Europe have one of these Europe conquer and wannabes? Uh, Napoleon, Hitler, Putin. I think they may have. Uh, uh, I think before uh, Naps, you had Frederick Great. Oh, you've had lots of them, even more than that. You have to remember, they don't just want to conquer Europe, they want to conquer the world. You always have someone who wants to conquer the world. And it's not even just once a century. Usually there's a two or three in any century who want to conquer the world. And one or two who actually give it a jolly good go. Now, one of the key British ships involved in the 18th of June is HMS Censure, 
Now, you've all heard about her before because I've been dis I've discussed Diamond Rock with you a few times. Yes, Censure is the vessel which is involved in that. She's the one which goes to Martinique and goes, hmm, you know what? I think that rock would look good with some guns on it. It would. Although, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, let's see. She has a good, good career. And she's a very useful ship. She's also quite heavily armed for a fur, uh, for a fur rate. Well, that's what I'm saying. She's definitely second generation third rate. She has 32 pounder guns on her gun deck. She has an upper deck, a gun deck, 24 pounder guns. And her quarter deck and forecastle are nine pounder guns. So yeah, she is very, very well armed for a third rate. And she's pretty darn scary, but she's a good example of what the British are churning out. The, the, the British churn out what I would call the utility third rate. It can do pretty much any job, any time it's required. They have enough firepower, they're even going to cause most first and second rates to go, hmm, we'll win this, but it ain't going to be easy. Um, and sometimes they don't win it, which is really annoying for them. And they've got certainly enough firepower that anything below them is going to go, hmm, well, you're big, aren't you? Hello, Rick Basaba. Um, yeah, out. Yes, I also never heard of Diamond Rock. Okay, so I did have covered some other videos, but I'm quite happy to give you a bit of an instruction again. What happens is there is this rocky outcrop just outside of Martinique, which is a French island in the Caribbean. And it's called Diamond Rock. And the British realize they can get in close to it. And the British getting close to it. And then you think, well, could we put a fort on it? And so they do. They land a small party. They put them in, give them supplies. They land a few cannon. Set it up. And it basically creates a nightmare. And it's one of the issues which the French and Spanish forces have to deal with. Where in the run to Trafalgar, in the Trafalgar campaign, is the Diamond Rock. Which is going, going, oh, that's, that's there. Oh. Oh. It's a pretty cool ship. With a pretty cool career. Now. I could talk about Courageous, which is a cool ship, but I also want to talk about Hermione. Because Courageous is cr cute, and she has a fairly interesting career. She's laid down in 1777, launched in 1778, and serves 17, uh, well, and serves from April 1778. So she does spend 11 years in service with the French Navy. She only spends four years in service with the Royal Navy. Of course, they're not that keen on her. But the Concorde class frigate, the fact is you have Hermione. And Hermione, this thing pe pictured, was completed in Rochefort by the Asselin organization in 2014. She's a complete reproduction of the vessel which achieved fame by ferrying General Lafayette to the United States in 1780. And 
she has sailed across the Atlantic. She just, she's had a really cool career. And it's really worth looking up the pictures of her in the construction. I know she did a 2015 voyage and she did a 2018 voyage. I presume she was planning on a 2021 voyage that didn't take place. So I'm hoping she gets to do a 2023 voyage or something. Because it'd be really nice to see where she could go. Because she undertook a voyage. I think she's only ba based in Rushford. 11 stopovers. She sailed across the Atlantic. And it'd be really fun to see what she could get up to. It'd be really fun. I'm not sure what happened there. The screen did something weird on me, so I'm hoping it was okay for all of you. High CPU detect usage detected. I'm not sure how. Bam ba -da. Because <laughs> I'm not using anything more than I normally use. So don't ask me why they keep saying you're flashing any high CPU usage. I really have not much up. Audio visual images. Sorry about that. Audio clip for a couple of seconds. Hmm. No ideas. Apologies. And anyway, Hermione, cute ship. And you can, if you go to her Wikipedia page, tons and tons of pictures of her. Worthwhile having a look at. Because how many of these ships are there? Are no, this is this ship was actually rebuilt. It's worth our looking at just for that, and it's Rochefort. So it's worth our going and seeing. She's just an amazing piece of naval architecture, and the pictures they have on her are gorgeous. She's the sister. Well, she's based on the sister of Courageous, which was a Concord class frigate. And, as said, she's been built entirely to represent the vessel which took Lafayette to America. What's really funny is when you see the picture of the scaled model next to the actual construction which they're building. She's a good looking ship. Bologna. Bologna is another cool ship. Now, she was designed by Sir Thomas Slade and is probably the prototype of the third rate Royal Navy ship. From her, he starts experimenting. Arrogant, Ramleys, Egmont, Elizabeth classes are all slight variations in the shape of the underwater hull. And then the Culloden class are similar but slightly larger. Therefore, you can consider her, she has a roughly 40 cousins in terms of third rates. 
Now, this is the something interesting, because the British do experiment more of their designs. The French tend to come with trying to come up with standardized design and try to build to it. The British tend to experiment slightly more, but in many ways the British are building more, and the British have the ability to do that because of the depth of construction they have going on. That allows them to experiment. Whereas the French are trying to deal with maximizing the output, especially when they keep losing ships. To not just things like the British, but also the things like the fact their officers aren't that experienced at taking their ships to sea. And they say, do you keep a resource one to open so you can see if something is using a lot of CPU memory? Yes. I do sometimes have to have arguments with MS Teams. I'm just checking that is turned off. Because that's what's been causing me the most fun of arguments recently. Caused all the sounds current troubles before uh, before I went away to Canada. Hmm. So anyway, in the Ultimate Admiral's Age of Sail, the 64 gun strip line is called the Valona class. Well, and the Royal Navy, the 64, the Valona were the seven, it was the beginning of the 74s. Took long enough. What were the French Navy good at other than donating their ships to the Royal Navy? The French Navy. <sighs> the trouble is for the French Navy, it's hanging on to institutional memory and passing it on. So this is the thing. It's not like saying they aren't good at stuff. They are good. They wouldn't. They would not be a worthy opponent if they were not good at what they do. The trouble is you don't get a lot of passing on of information from one generation to the next because they don't get the chance to. So you don't get that institutional memory to build on. So that's what the French Navy has most of the trouble. Now, Alceste is a Magicine class. Magician? Um... The thing is, there's a joke in um, in Yes Minister, which is a British program and quite a fun comedy one. Never seen it. Um, where they call something the Mumbo Jumbo because the this particular jumbo jet. Is technically actually owned by British Airways, but has been worn so many national color national flags in the same week that no one knows who it really belongs to anymore. It just keeps flying off to some place. You know, it gets painted up in new colours, flies off, picks up the leader of that country, brings them to the UK for a visit. They have their visit, they fly home. It gets a new paint job, goes pick up the next, goes pick up the next one, takes them to the UK, and uh, it, keep, it keeps doing that. Well, there were some ships like that, and Alceste is kind of like this. She starts off with, of course, France. She's built by Toulon Shipyard, uh, laid down in May 1780, launched in October 1780, and commissioned in February 1781. She's captured by Britain in 1793. She is then... Hmm, how do I put this politely? Uh, the British consider her not that helpful. So they transfer her to the Kingdom of Sardinia in 1794. She's then captured again by the French in 1794. Um, Britain actually pretty much transfers across almost as soon as they have her. 
she's captured again in 1799. And yes, that explains her history. So she goes French, British, Sardinian, French, British. In the space of a nine-year career? No. No, no, no. I'm being a bit wrong. A cruel here. In the space of a 21-year career, she changes. She goes French, British, Sardinian, French, British. She changes hands five times. I sometimes feel like when I'm talking about these ships, like I'm some sort of used car salesman. Don't worry, sir. Don't worry, sir. No, no, no. It's only got a few miles on the clock. It's a really good value. A real little goer. It's a real little goer. Really clean lines. Really sweet lines. Great, great sale. Great sale. It's going to be reliable. It's only going to have done a few little light service. Only a light service. Why has it changed how so many times? Oh, no reason. No reason. It's just... It's just so good, but, you know, the trouble is it's small, so people grow out of it. They have a family. They need something bigger, but it's a great starter car. It's an amazing starter car. It's what you want as your starter car. It's going to be great for you, sir. I really do promise, sir. It's going to be great for you. Sorry, I, I am actually sounding like one of the used car salesmen I've come across in my life. There's Hotsky. It was only shot at once. Best thing about these ships is they are free. It wasn't the case of the transfer from the Royal Navy to the Sardinian Navy. Dark 905, would there ever be a ship swap so the original nations get their ships back? Providing they would have an equivalent to swap. Hmm, not really. Oh... I once had that conversation. Melanie just pointed out there. Just to tell the guy to make a certain part of an anatomy larger or I'll track women and sold. Yeah, I have had salesmen try it up with me and I guess go. I'm here to buy a Subaru. I don't think that any of that. As much as I love them and enjoy them, I don't think any of them have that much bad value. That they can alter genetics. Or, and this is my point. Make people uh, make, uh, make people think I'm more attractive. So again, alter genetics. I don't, Scott. Wait, so the Royal Navy sold it to Sardinia. The French captured it. No, the British gave it to the Sardinians. The French captured it, and the British recaptured it. Sounds like a scam to me. It was certainly something going on. And then we have HMS Capitan. Yes, HMS Capitan is that Capitan. You all know her. You've heard uh, of her in many, uh, many other stories. This is a picture of her in her greatest moment when she's capturing the San Nicholas and the San Josef at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in 1797, whilst under command of the then Captain Nelson. Um, yeah. There is an interesting discussion as to who's exactly in charge for during this battle. There is one. But, yeah, no. Nah. She's part of John Markham's squadron, and I'm fairly certain she's under Richard Strachan. I'm fairly certain. 
He was in charge. He was in command of HMS Diamond before her, and he takes command at some point in 1799 of Captain. But no one's quite sure when. But we know that the officer who was in command before him was not there for the battle. So that means to me that it's probably Strachan has taken charge. <laughs> Love the Royal Navy records here. Loving the Royal Navy records. But yeah, this is HMS Captain. She is armed with 28 32 pounders, 28 18 pounders. And another 18 nine pounders split between her quarter deck and forecastle. Please note the bottom level is 32 pounders. They're the one the ones which make the really big bangs when you're a third rate. Like to cause people a lot of upset and stress. Night six eight three one. I don't expect that the idea of Bismarck straying colours to Pirin. Bismarck wouldn't make the to the UK as a crew would scuttle. I, I if Bismarck has struck her colours for some reason, whether the crew try to scuttle her or not would depend on when they did scuttle her. Uh, and when they did strike their colours, if they struck their colours during the night when most of the crew are otherwise engaged and might not know what's going on until the Royal Navy destroyers have drawn up alongside and have taken prisoner, because you could guarantee Vian's squadron would be there within like a... Shoot! Hello! You've got traveled class destroyers on either side. <whistles> Hello. Your, your guns mo train anything other than fore and aft. The torpedoes will be loosed and you'll be sunk. Um, you have you have four tribals and you have two tribals coming alongside and a pirouette. By the way, the poles are going straight down into your engineering spaces to make sure you don't try and scuttle the ship, which they're going to try and claim. And that would be an interesting one. But um, if it happened during daylight hours, you know, that could be more problematic because it'd be very visible to the crew. Why was Captain HS Captain never reused in Model 2 as a lead ship? Um, honestly? The last captain was the 1869 Mar Marsted Turreted ship that, of course, managed to founder in a gale of Cape Finisterre. So I'm fairly certain it's because of that particular piece of history. There hasn't been a captain since. There was a 70-gun third rate, a 70-gun third rate, a 74-gun third rate, a 72-gun third rate, a 100-gun first rate, and uh, was to have been an iron screw ship, but was instead launched as HMS Argincourt in 1865, which if that had happened, instead of Argincourt, had a captain had been given that name, then captain might well have been used in World War II, if not World War One. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, was there ever any trust lieutenant or a trust commander? I cannot remember either of those. I'm surprised there wasn't, but yeah, I think captain's more likely. So, then we have Salamine. Now, Salamine, I again have no picture of, but she's pretty darn cool. In fact, there are two ships which are both Spanish in their origin, which are pretty darn cool in this battle, and I would like to know more about them. Salamine, originally Infante, captured from the Spanish in December 1793, renamed Salamine in honour of the Battle of Salamis in May 1798, which is a battle which the French are well known to have been a crucial part of. Oh, Napoleon. Anyway. 
Really cool little ship. And she's an 18 gun brig. Then we have HMS Emerald. Now, Emerald is about as frigate as you can get. She is an Amazon class, fifth freight frigate, designed by Sir William Rule in 1794 for the Royal Navy. And I do love the idea of a constructor called Sir William Rule. I just find it so ruling. Anyway. She took part in the hunting down and capturing of the, uh, well, various uh, various enemy ships. So basically, uh, she's used for all sorts of weird, interesting things. She takes part, uh, supposed to be present for the Battle of Nile, but arrives in Abaca Bay nine days too late. Uh, she's part of Rear Admiral John Thomas Duckworth's uh, squadron in the action of the 7th April 1800 of Cadiz. Uh, takes part in operations in the Caribbean for Samuel Hood's fleet. Uh, serves in Western jet approaches before taking uh, joining the fleet under the command of James Gambier. Taking part in the Battle of Basque Roads. She's ordered in 1794. She's built by Thomas Pitcher. She costs £14,419. She's laid down June 1794, launched May uh, July 1795, commissioned August 1795, and broken up January 1836. So she gives the Royal Navy 41 years of service, pretty much. She's armed with 26 18-pounder guns, 8 9-pounder guns, and 6 32-pounder carronades on her quarterdeck, uh, 2 9-pounder guns, and 2 32-pounder carronades on her forecastle. She's heavily armed for a frigate and very capable for a frigate. No, she's not going to rank in up there against the American super frigates, but she's certainly got enough firepower that anything short of that is going to be going... You know what? I prefer not to be here. I, I really prefer not to be here. She seems a little um, OTT for the requirements. No, sort of, Alex, do you know why the pyramids are in Egypt? Because they're too heavy to carry back to the Rosary Museum. Actually, seriously, someone did look into the idea of taking them down brick by brick and bringing them back to UK, but they decided not to. So that's why we've got one of the great Pharisee columns in the UK, in London, said. And then there's Elect. Which would be captured from the French by the British in August 1793. Then the British basically used it, well, burnt it because they found it. It got, they didn't consider it that good. It got caught on rocks and the British burned it. So the French salvaged it in December 1793 and rebuilt her. And the British got about, and after the French had gone through the cost of rebuilding her and getting her back in the service, of course, the British then captured her again in 1799. Obelisk. Not a column. Sorry. So anyway, wait a minute. Someone actually wanted to do that. That was the most British thing I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. And then there is the Santa Teresa. Which was captured from the Spanish in February 1799 by the Royal Navy. So, yeah, she's a very... And again, there is not even a Wikipedia page on this ship. There is not even a wiki page on her.
Who would you rather have in command of a frigate, Cochrane or Edward Pellew? Who would be more aggressive? Probably Cochrane, but I probably want Pellew in command. I like Cochrane. He's a very good. He's a very good officer, but Pellew, Pellew is a far better frigate officer. Um, but no, the Sp basically she's ultimate proof of how hospitable fo foes the Spanish fr actually are, and this is. From Sir John Markham, who had was in command of censure, uh, was in command of censure under Sir Admiral Sir Vincent during this blockade of Cadiz. So confident we are in the, in the integrity of these poor Spaniards that the officers have, by, uh, by their means and their, uh, got their linen washed in the town. We receive fresh beef, mutton, fowls, eggs, and vegetables from the Portugal and Tangiers. Yeah, you are actually blockading a port. And at the same time, you have people from the port rowing out to your ship, taking your clothes and linen onto their little boat, and taking that little linen all the way back to their home, where they wash it for you, and then you get it brought out. So, I'm not sure whether that's an example of how to fight a war or how not to fight a war. I do know that if you'd had that scene in Game of Thrones, it would have been considered completely absurd. And there'd been people writing that and going, no one in war would actually do this. But here it actually happened. I, I I could imagine I could hear the people who you know there are these there are always lovely people and I get like I get a few of them every now and again who would like to call me an armchair admiral because a I'm on that show but uh, on that show for for um, World of Warships but also of the fact that I'm an academic and I talk about naval history and I do the things from naval history side but the thing is. I then will turn, see that those same people turn around and they will say things about shows. Oh, this is completely unhistorical. And da, 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 you would never actually do this. Da, 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 da. And I look there and go, well, actually, yeah, they did. <laughs> oh, you have no idea. Basically, in nicest way, most of the time, fiction can't get away with some of the stuff that they do in reality. My question, how much were they paying, said locals, for the sailors? Apparently it was very affordable because even the sailors could pay for it. So even the sailors had enough money that if they wanted their clothes washed, they could get them washed by the locals. It's nice for the fleet, but this again shows you the strength of the British blockading squadrons, because the British blockading squadrons had enough money in it, it could afford to do this. It's also going to sound strange, because this actually has an impact on the local economy. And by the British doing this, by the British engaging this trade quite happily with the locals, it means that the locals are then looking at the guys manning the artillery forts, which are supposed to keep the British away from the port and going, but if you fire at the British, then we have to row further. And it makes our, uh, our life more difficult. So, you know, if they're just sitting out there and they're not actually attacking you, why do you, do you want, uh, why would you shoot at them? Which is great for the British, because it means basically they're just anchored off a harbour doing a blockade, and they're not being attacked by the local force. Thank you, Dr. Nanavo. The 
they also got wine and other things supplied by the locals. It's a it's a thriving trade going on. Same with Cam, except the person behind the idea and successfully and successfully moving the giant thorough head now in the British Museum was an Italian strongman and hydraulics expert. Yeah, the, usually the British have the money to pay for these things. Other people have the ideas. I was asking, you, made the civilians didn't know they were blockaded. No, they knew they were blockaded. But the other thing was the blockading ships tended to take on board a lot of supplies from the ships that they were stopping getting in. And then they'd want to get rid of them, so they'd sell the supplies which didn't look like issues, that, things they were worried about getting in, back to the people going in. They didn't quite go into the local pubs. They weren't quite that trusting. No one was quite going to Look, there's a you can do it with the little boats coming out, going back to the fords. It's what can be done on little boats. That's fine. Uh, actually going ashore, that's more what the Sydney Smith would do. But St. Vincent found it very useful because he liked having clean, ben uh, clean linen to sleep in. So basically, his steward made sure that he had enough sets of sheets so he would have the sheets going off to get the washed and would have another set on there. And it would be, again... With the heat, etc., of the Mediterranean and all these things, people are sweating more. You know, you need to clean. You need to keep things clean. The Royal Navy is obsessed with cleanliness and keeping up the health of the blockading squadron. Again, this is a tremendous uh, the, building. This sort of relationship with the people you're blockading really does help a blockading squadron out because their point is about the image of blockading. Now, this is the write-up from the London Gazette. And I'm going to read this out to you all. From the letter from Earl St. Vincent KB to Evan Nepen, Esquire, dated at Port Mahon, the 22nd of June, 1799. You will hereforth receive, for the information of the Lords Commissioners of the Admiralty, a letter from Vice Admiral Lord Keith, enclosing one from Captain Markham, of His Majesty's ship Central, giving an account of the capture of a squadron of French frigates which had made their escape from Alexandria. This is Queen Charlotte at sea, June 19th, 1799. My lord, I have the honour to inform your lordship of the capture of five French vessels by the squadron under my command and to enclose your lordship Captain Markham's letter, whose ship was more advanced and whose conduct on this occasion, as on all others, has been most exemplary. I have the honour to be yours sincerely, Lord Keith. Central, June 19th, 1799. My Lord, I have the honour to inform you that, pursuant to your signal of yesterday, for a general chase to the northeast, I came up with and captured three frigates on the evening of this day. The Bellona and Santa Teresa frigate being the nearest, when the two stormers struck, I made their signals to the, take possession of them while I pursued the third, which struck also in half an hour afterwards. The Emerald, in the meantime, took the Salamine brig, and the captain, the Alette. This squadron was commanded by Rear Admiral Perret, 33 days from Jaffa, bound to Toulon. For their names and force, I beg leave to you to refer to the list. I have the honour to be yours sincerely, sir, 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 J. Markham. And here's the list. La Toulon, which we know as Junon, Rear Admiral Perret, Porquier, Captain, 40 guns, 18 pounders, 500 men. La Courageous Beale, Captain, uh, 22 guns, 12 pounders, 300 men. La Sest, Barret, Captain, 36 guns, 12 pounders, 300 men. La Salamine, Brig, Sandre, Lieutenant, 18 guns, 6 pounders, 220 men. La Elette, Brig, Demay, Lieutenant, 14 guns, 6 pounders, 120 men. Okay. 
Um, let's see. Evan in 1799 was the secretary to the, to the board of the Admiralty. Um, he had previously been the Under Secretary of State for War. He will go on to become Chief Secretary for Ireland, Commissioner of the Admiralty, and Governor of Bombay, 1812-1819. He's the, a Member of Parliament for Queensborough from 1796-1802, then moved to Bridport, where he would be still in service to 1812. Uh, he donated a clock tower with Cupola in about 1805 to the town of Bridport Town Hall. Made a baronet in 1802, admitted to Privy Council in 1804, was a member of, Ra of the Royal Society from 1820, and was appointed to Sheriff of Dorset in 1822, but died in that year in his uh, estate and lodders. Um, there is a river in Australia, the Nepan River in New South Wales, uh, there is also the Nepen High Highway, Nip Point Nepen, both in Victoria, Nepen Bay in South Australia, and Nepen Island in the extreme internal territory of Norfolk Island. In Canada, there is Nepen, uh, the city of Nepen, Ontario, uh, which was a, a former city of Nepen, Ontario. It was amalgamated uh, with, Ot uh, with Ottawa in 2001. So it's now part of uh, now part of Ottawa, Nepen Point and Nepen Bay, and in India there is Nepen Road, Nepen Sea Road in Mumbai, and uh, yeah. Nepen, quite an important person. When they give the size of a gun, that's large water ship. Yep. Uh, Doctor, can you imagine the conversation, Stuart? I need clean bed sheets. Stuart, yes, sir. I'll send them to be washed in the port with blockading. <laughs> it worked. Now, here is the interesting thing, because that really doesn't give you much of an account of what happened. So I've had to go piecing together from various French and other English sources roughly what happened. So please explain, listen to this while I explain it. So roughly 60 miles from Toulon, it varies between some accounts put as close as 50 miles, some as far as 70 miles from Toulon. But it could have been as little as five hours sailing if there's good wind. From say a safety. On the 17th of June 1799, so yesterday, Perez Division spotted the 30 ship fleet under Lord Keith. Now, there's an interesting thing because it's a 30 ship fleet roughly, but there are frigates and other support vessels around there, so it's it's calling a 30 ship fleet, but there's the numbers are not quite 30. It's a uh, rounding. At which point, Keith also spots them, and he decides to send a task force of three 74 gunships line and two frigates under Commander John Markham in order to go and give chase. Now, remember, Perez's force has already run from Sir Sidney Smith's two ships of the line and one frigate. They're now facing a force of three ships of the line and two frigates. This is not good. The wind was actually very weak. And so they weren't really as able to sail as fine and as close to the wind as they'd like. Which meant the chase lasted 28 hours. It's not a short one. It's overnight. Pere puts in every single trick he has available. He tries everything he can to lose Markham's force. Markham managed to do two things better than Pere. One, he managed to anticipate Pere's tricks and pull them against him, mostly, so he can keep up with him. And secondly, he manages to hold his force together far better than Pere does. But there again, Pere's force has been sailing all around unsupported for weeks now. You can understand them not being at their best. 
By the evening, Yunon, Junon, and Alcest are sailing together within hailing range of each other. Whilst Courageous uh, was about a mile off the flagship, Yunon, and the brig Salamina Let are between four and seven miles ahead of Yunon. So Courageous is sort of basically you've got Yunon and Alert assessed here, you've got Courageous about here, and you've got Salamina and Alert about here, basically running for their lives. At seven o'clock in the evening, Thompson's 74-gun Bellona, followed by Captain and the two frigates, so it's actually four of the ships, managed to get within a quarter of a mile of Yunon. Bellona opens fire, as a 74 is often inclined to do, and Yunon and Alceste immediately strike. They basically go, there is no way in any way we are dealing with that. There just isn't. We can't do this. And there is nothing wrong with that. You know, you can't be expected to do, uh, to fight everyone and fight everything. And it's going to sound strange. There are some very interesting discussions which go into this and go into what's going on. Now, They are, of course, have basically gone, right then, we surrender. This is not a good time for us. We do not want to be here. Which you can, all of it, understand. You can really understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. <laughs> I'm just making sure I have my copy of Lloyd's List from 26th of July up in front of me. That's the 14th of July. It's not the 26th, is it? That's the 26th of July. Now, what I find interesting is there's actually a difference between the Lloyd's list and this list here, which the Navy issues, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Now, with our system and Yunon gone, okay, you could expect the Royal Navy to go, well, we've got two, why do we need the rest? Well, they do. HMS Censure has already been racing ahead, and she's managed to come, put, uh, sort of divided off, and has gone off after Courageous. And she commenced firing upon her. After Yunnan and Alceste have surrendered, they put a course prize cruise on her. But don't worry, Censure, which is, let's be honest, if we consider quickly their guns, Censure carrying uh, 28 32 pounders, 30 24 pounders. And 16 nine pounders. The courageous carrying 26 12 pounders and six six pounders, as she's officially supposed to be fitted, doesn't seem to be carrying her full load in this fight. And remember, with only 15 rounds per gun, she's trying to fight away. But, uh, you know, just in case she's having any trouble, just in case Sensua might have any difficulty. Uh, Bellona comes and backs her up. So suddenly, Courageous, with her, maybe, if she's lucky, broadside each of roughly 13 12-pounder guns, versus broadsides which include, let's see, 14 32-pounder guns, 15 24-pounder guns, and... 
I'm presuming somewhere in the region of eight, nine pounder guns, just in case you need extra. I'm not really sure. Th th there is one which is going, if she's firing anything below, uh, anything instead of just her upper gun deck, then they are just wasting shot. But no, um, they're knowing the Royal Navy, they are firing everything. Bellona comes and backs up Censure, and basically Courageous goes, you know what, I'd like to surrender now. At the same time, Emerald is racing ahead and finds Salamine. Now, Salamine goes, Hello, Emerald. You have 32 pound of carronades. Yes. And Salamine decides to surrender. Similarly, there is poor little alert. Now, let us remind ourselves of alert stats because it's always worth remembering what was alert stats. Alert is officially armed with some possibly, possibly 14 six-pounder guns. Possibly as many as 14 six-pounder guns. Now, she has the joy of being found by HMS Captain, remember, which has a lower gun deck of 28 32-pounder guns and 28 an upper gun deck of 28 18-pounder guns and a quarter deck of 14 9-pounder guns and a forecast of 9-pounder guns. So in the nicest way, the quarter deck of HMS Captain has more firepower than the entirety of Alette. The quarter deck. Okay, let me just clarify this. The quarter deck, which has 14 9 pounder guns, can outshoot the 14 6 pounder guns on alert. The quarter deck of HMS Captain has the same firepower as alert does. Well, actually, has more firepower than alert does. By a long way, 50% more. Okay, just clarifying that. Surprisingly, then, Alert goes, you know what? I choose life. I realize that this could be a meme, a poor little British, a little sailing ship sailing along, and then a huge third rate coming along next to her, and the third sailing ship going, we surrender, we choose life. But that is the case. That is basically what she does. She goes, no, I feel like living. Now, here is the interesting thing. Lloyd's List, on the 26th of July, reports the ships that are captured as being Alceste with 36 guns and 460 men, which if we look at this way, it does accord with the Navy List. Juno, 44 guns and 560 men. Now, Juno doesn't exist. We know her as Junon. They're calling her, she's called Tunon in this particular paper, and she's listed having 40 guns, uh, all 18 pounders, but she is listed again as having 500 men, not 560 men. Courageous. Well, in our Navy list, she's listed as having 22 guns, all 12 pounders, and having 300 men aboard. According to Lloyd's list, she has 44 guns and 500 men. And the two Corvettes are both listed as having 16 guns, when we know According to the Navy, 18 guns and 14 guns. So there you go. Lloyd's List, that usually absolutely reliable source of information. And we have it disputing with the Navy's own letter, which is written right at the time. And this, of course, is a list provided by John Markham. So you can ask the case of who's probably right. Is it going to be Markham or is it going to be... Lloyd's List? You presume Lloyd's List will be working from the information supplied by Markham. But, you know, there are chances. So, Frank, what did you do in Navy? Well, I spent months blockading Cadiz. Really? That sounds rather dull. Dull? It was the best paid holiday I ever had. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, is it really easy to blockade a harbour if you don't need to resupply your ships? <laughs> is it really easy to blockade a harbour if you don't need to resupply your ships? It's brilliant if you don't need to worry about disease breaking out because they're all getting wa their clothes washed. <laughs> Something there. Wouldn't the sailors normally wash the stuff there? Yes. Uh, 
I suffered. So it doesn't. Nine Pounder at that point would be an anti boarding or sniper gun, wouldn't it? I'm surprised the crew <laughs> roster hasn't grown much for frigates over the centuries. I was asking, speaking in a French accent, Sacre Bleu, there is an RN squadron on the horizon. All right, we run, free drinks in port for the crew that gets captured as at, la at last. Call uh, Gaswick, Alet, Norman, yes, Norman, has the bad bad to sound the alert and maybe scare some fish. I, yeah, I feel great respect. These little ships matter. They're actually useful things. They're not supposed to be used in this way. But it does always provide the answer whenever someone turns around to me and goes, well, these ships are not designed for a high-threat environment. And I go, these ships weren't designed for a high-threat environment. But the trouble is, when you're right at fighting a peer conflict, there is no such thing as, yes, we ha are able to fight a limited war where the threat will all be in one area and the other th the threat won't be in other areas. No, the threat can get around. Knights of for one, there's only be one Santa Teresa, as far as I know. Only one. But no. So this is why we get into this issue. A, you have a differing write up of reports, which is always fun, but this is the balance of forces, and this is where the real fun starts to begin. Because. This table, by the way, comes from Richard Harding's book, Sea Power and Naval Warfare, 1650 to 1830. It's an absolutely amazing book to read. It's sitting around here somewhere. And I know I've mentioned it several times before, but I will never overestimate it or sell it as being a good book. But there is one thing I have annoying for in that. Basically, it tries to use battleships and cruisers back on these fast ships. And roughly, as I can figure it, battleships for him are third rates and above. Cruisers are fourth rates and below. <sighs> Roughly. This is 1800. In 1800, the year after this action, France and their allies have 90 frigates, uh, cruisers, and uh, cruisers. That's four freights and below. The British have 158. They lost five in this one action the previous year. I started off beginning by talking about charts. There are all the operations of war which you never hear about. Why are the British blockading squadrons always as good as they are? Why are they able to get as close to the, uh, core, uh, to the shores as they are? Because they have charts. Who goes and makes the charts? Well, you don't risk a ship at a line to go and, do, you know, go and find your navigation, do you? It's very expensive. What do you do? Well, you'd send in a 14-gun ship like HMS Alert. As you would become. And that's what you send in. You send in something small expendable to an extent. You'd rather not lose the crew, but if you lose the ship, you can replace it very easily enough. That's the hard metrics of war. So losing these ships matters. In 1790, the French have 64, the French and Allies have 64, the British, ha uh, um, the British have 130. In 1796, the French have 144. The British have 160. In 1800, the British have 158. The French have 90. In 1805, the British have 160. The French have 71. The British admirals are always complaining they are short of ships. They are always claiming they do not have enough frigates. And yet, consistently, they have far more frigates and uh, ships below, uh, or vessels below that than their opponents do. So why are the British always short? Because there are just so many jobs these ships do. Yes, they'll be doing the maritime security role. They'll be doing the anti-raider role. They'll be doing fisheries protection, fisheries monitoring. 
They'll be doing the guardship duties. They'll be doing the survey work. They'll be doing the exploration work. They'll be doing the convoy work. They'll be doing the rapid trans transportation of communications work. They'll be doing the reconnaissance and repeating for the fleet, the communications work in fleet actions and in especially in shore squadrons. They'll be a critical asset for in shore squadrons. You can never have enough frigates and below. So think about that the next time someone turns around to you and says, oh, but that ship's only this, and therefore it's never going to be in a combat zone. There were trawlers in service in World War One and World War Two, which were inside combat zones on a regular basis. And they had to be armed appropriately. But in no way, shape or form was a trawler ever armed in a, to the extent that he was going to take on a destroyer or even a sloop or a corvette. It just wasn't. It was armed to do what the trawler would have to do. It was armed to the extent that it wasn't going to get overrun by something equivalently sized or smaller. And it was probably going to get, be able to defend itself to an extent against air attack. But it wasn't designed to deal with a swarm of aircraft. It wasn't designed to be over, uh, to, you know, be un over, uh, uh, being violent. And it's the same with 14 gunships like Aleph. Yes, they are a laugh in terms of their guns. But they have a good reason for existing. And trust me, the French Navy was a lot, lot, lot weaker for the loss of alert than you would think from the number of guns. Because that ship is incredibly useful. The French Navy complain they don't have charts. Well, guess what other ships would you go and get the charts? and make the charts, and do the soundings, and spend the hours, the days, going up and down, dropping a, uh, dropping a weight on a line, and going, how that's gone, this many leagues, this much, this, well, this many fathoms, da 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 So what you're really seeing here is you're seeing the erosion of a navy. That is what the French uh, is happening to the French. In 1796, they have more ships of line in service than the British do. But the British have more frigates in service. They have 21 more ships in service than the British. But the British still have 16 more frigates in service and below than the French. In 1800, four years later, the British have 285 vessels in service. The French have 216. The British have a one more ship of line. But they have 68 more. 68 more of the cruisers. In 1805, Battle of Trafalgar. The British have 136 ships of line, third rate uh, ships of line and above in service. 136. They have 160 cruisers, that's four freights and below. France has 96 and 71. They have 40 less of the battleship classification. They have 89 less of the cruiser uh, classification. Hmm. This means that the British always maintained a lead in the small ships. Why? Because they were underpin all the fleet actions. Yes, you need the force when you need it. You need the fighting force. You need those core ships. 
but you have to think about what you need them for and what they're going to be used for. Thank you, Night Heron Productions. It's really nice to get the super chat. Recently on Twitter, there was a debate going on, which I ended up bowing out of because I just got uh, there was no there was the other person was never going to see my position. And the whole debate was on the OPVs, the river class. And I was making the case that I would like to see them up armed. I'd like to see them have a 40mm to put forward, because you can get smart ammunition for that that has a longer range. And I'd like the existing 30mm moved off, and I'd like the missiles that can be fitted to that mount added to that mount. And basically, the argument kept going circular, because it was a case of, these are maritime security assets for fishery protection. They only need to do this, 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 this. Well, they're not operating domestic waters now. They're now part of the overseas uh, overseas squadron rather than the offshore patrol squadron. And I'm talking about the batch twos, not the batch ones. And they're operating in higher threat environments. And yes, the areas you're talking about when you're sort of talking about the Gulf, when you're talking about the South China Sea, you would prefer to be taking a frigate into. I would love to be taking a frigate into. But the trouble is we don't have enough frigates, and we're never going to have enough frigates. In this period, the British have 160 cruisers in service at two points in this 15-year period. 160. And they still do not have enough for all the operations they need of them. So guess what? Some of those ships doing some of those operations are nowhere near the frigates or corvettes or sloops or whatever you want to call them would have been. They are the equivalent of the trawlers from World War II. The question is, though, no one looked at a trawler and went, well, your only job is to protect and make sure the nets are deployed for the uh, the anti uh, stop the anti-submarines coming in. So we don't. you're not going to be in a high-threat environment that's not, you're not aimed to go and operate off the enemy shore, so we're not going to give you any weapons to defend yourself or enough to defend yourself against the modern threats. Or even, in this way, again, a 40mm and a 30mm and this is not enough to defend them against modern threats. I'm not claiming it will be. It's not turning them into a first rate, any way, shape, or form. It's about giving them enough weapons to survive against a threat which is the same size or smaller in a maritime security environment. And again, one of the issues we have to deal with today, which is kind of like the Age of Sail, is that there are a huge number of non-state actors who are capable. And they are. You know, people have forgotten that the, the separatist movement in Sri Lanka used to have a navy. And it was an effective navy at various points. It wouldn't be the first time all different organizations have a navy. We've been dealing with piracy. We've been dealing with all sorts of issues in the Straits of Hormuz. No matter, sometimes under some very interesting flags. We're now looking at the South China Sea. We're looking at a world where the whole maritime security gambit runs very close to the national security gambit and in many ways overlaps thanks to the whole Grey War scenario. You have to start looking at your small ships and going, you need enough firepower to get yourself out of dealing with what could be equivalent threats. We know There's no point trying to arm you to deal with uh, p more potent threats. You're never going to be able to. In fact, actually arming you like that will increase your risk. Because there is no way you can mount any enough 32-pounders on alert to give her a chance. None at all. So there's no point. So you need to start. The, basically, the lesson of this is that the frigates are important. The frigates are what are giving the French presence in the Mediterranean at this point, And these five are thrown away. They're thrown away because they lack supplies. They're thrown away because they don't have any ammunition. But most of all, they're thrown away because they're put in a situation where they have to run home into the teeth of a blockading force, which is sitting there very comfortably off too long to try and get to supplies. 
and they have no chance to do anything else. Thank you, Jack Ray. That's very kind of you. And that loses them five. And if we go to this, okay, that's an actual appreciable percentage of that figure. They're down to 90 at this point. Five gone in one battle, all captured. 158. And by the way, this is one of the interesting things when you start to look at the summary of these ships and what happens to them. The Royal Navy doesn't actually use them all for the things we'd think they do use them all. Pere, taken prisoner, but is exchanged almost immediately. He actually has to go court, undergo court martial, presided over by Vice Admiral of Finvan of Fevenard. Uh, the court finds that the superior Ottoman and British forces of Syria, the partial disarmament of his frigates, their low food and water supplies had been legitimate reasons for Pere to disobey Napoleon's orders and return to Toulon. The court then unanimously honorably acquits him. Junon, well, she's taken to Royal Navy as Princess Charlotte, as mentioned. Courageous is incorporated, but becomes a prison hulk, possibly at Majorca, but more likely Malta. Um, and we must remember that the great success of Malta turns into the longest running siege of Malta, where the islanders themselves are besieging the French occupiers and basically tormenting them with the assistance of the Royal Navy. Alert is commissioned into the Royal Navy as HMS Mallorca. Alceste becomes a floating battery. Salamine becomes HMS Salamine and serves in Mediterranean and captures two privateers for the Royal Navy. Very useful ship, thank you very much. By the way, in 1802, after the Treaty of Amans, Alceste, Alert, and Salamine are all disposed of. Courageous is still being a prison hulk. But guess what? Princess Charlotte is going to have quite a long career with the Royal Navy. Thank you very much. Royal Navy's taken everything, disposed of what they wanted. They've got enough, they're able to do what they want with the ships. But it's interesting to note that Alert, what is in Salamine, are commissioned. Alceste is turned into a floating battery. Courageous is basically used as a prison hulk. So two of the big frigates are... The two of the big frigates aren't used. One is very useful. That's continued to be used. And the two smaller ships are used by the Royal Navy until they can be disposed of. Until they don't need them. That shows you which has the value for the Royal Navy at this point. It's not the big frigates. One of them has value because it's in good condition. The other two, not really. But the brigs, oh, they're useful. We can use those. A few trawlers, probably not alone, had to be up gun to deal with surface submarines. World War Two, a World War One it was a six-pounder, i.e., fifty-seven millimeter. Yeah, in World War Two, the four-inch gun and three-inch gun, there are lots of them get single versions. It's a similar to the Russian army now. There's so many issues going on in the Russian army now. There's no point, but uh, basically, Ukraine is an interesting scenario in what's going on. Someone pointed out to me the other day that the Russians have a logistic system which is designed to survive nuclear war. Whereas the... Honestly, NATO doesn't. Because uh, NATO has an on-call logistic system. And Russia has a pre-packaged stuff will be delivered to you system. And we've worked out in advance and we're sending this to you whether you ask for it or not. Which is advantageous and disadvantageous. One advantage, you don't have to call up and ask for it. It's coming, so you don't have to waste precious airways to get it. Disadvantage, it means you're getting what they're sending you, whether you want it or whether you need that or need other things and not. There's all sorts of issues. Ah.
So Thompson, you're making an argument to bring back the soup designation as a class above the OPV. Honestly, the point is this. You have to have enough... Free. If you're not going to... Yeah, the trouble is to get a ship in the between is just going to cause trouble, okay? And to an extent, the Type 31s and 32s are being built for that sort of role. Frigate down to some maritime security. But you almost have to have the OPV upgun to the level of the trawler. Because there was a reason they were built as they were in the Cold War. The idea was the war would go nuclear very quickly... So basically, OPVs wouldn't be used. These days, we've got the idea that actually, if we were going to fight anything, it would be a longer war. It wouldn't go quickly, so quickly nuclear. It might even not go nuclear at all. After all, we've been worried about it in various instances, and so far, touch wood, it hasn't happened. And touch wood, it never will happen. Touch wood. So then you have to deal with also the Grey War scenario. In which case, you have to factor in what could happen to your ships if a deniable operation is done to take place. And this is one of the things which often I sort of put out there. Okay, you you could contest that these forces might not be able to buy all those commercial drones. They might not be able to fit them with sufficient uh, the weapons you think they should be. But the reality is, if a nation state decides it wants a deniable operation... It can find suitable actors who will do what it uh, will largely do what it wants because it finds the right actors who are motivated to do that anyway. Usually, they don't have to align or agree for them to be useful for each other. We'll make sure they get access to the uh, um, the funds and the equipment they need. They get it. Those actors act, and it's deniable. You see, Harry Wolf class needs a five inch. No, no, that's not what sort of saying. But if I was on the Harry the Wolf class, which are Arctic OPVs, and I was sort of looking at their size, well, a they're named for a tribal, for one of the most famous tribal destroyer captains in the entire history. But they're armed with a 25mm and two Browning machine guns. And yet they displace in at roughly 6,615 tons. I would have suggested, if I had been involved in it, that, especially considering how independent they're going to operate, a uh, 57 millimeter would have been sensible. Interesting to note that the Norwegian vessel they're be they're built on, uh, their base on, does carry a 57 millimeter, and also carries Simbad to a uh, Simbad surface to air missile systems. So, which is also commonly known as the Mistral system. Now. Myself, I would have probably gone with a C Scepter for her, and I would have gone with a 57mm. I'd have kept the weapons defensive. No need to go offensive weapons and start going, I'm going to park a Mark 41 VLS and cruise missiles and all those things, because you're just going to massively increase the expense of the ship. But you could put Cam, C Scepter, you could put, or C Sparrow, depending on which. Uh, it depends on what you're orientating your Type 26 and your Hunter, your. Uh, their future Canadian service combat and around. But basically, whichever one you're going to go for that, you want to go for the, uh, the same one for this. Uh, so it's mutually supporting logistics trains and training trains uh, and would actually help you with the you know future-proofing that technology, getting into your service. And a 57mm. And that would be the sort of what I would have. So it has enough firepower that it's a case of it's able to protect itself. From potential targets, potential attackers, maybe a forty millimeter as well on the aft, or a couple of forty millimeters. I'd be very interested in a design which had a fifty-seven millimeter forward and a pair of forty millimeters aft, and had some C scepter because then it'd be basically a case of I can't really attack you, so I'm still an OPV, but I'm able to defend myself, and I can launch helicopters and UAVs, and I can support troops, 
So basically, I am, unless you come at me with a certain level of force, you're not going to hurt me. So therefore, I have put myself at the range at which only really nation states can attack me. So therefore, I've made the maritime security task I'm going to be doing, which is going to be a very independent one for the dwarf class, uh, very viable. Do we go completely off topic? Now that you've seen one up close, what was the biggest surprise to you about the tribal class? Okay. So if I'm going to take tribal class questions. All right. Biggest surprise about being a border tribal class. Going around HM, uh, HMS Calav Cavalier did not in any way prepare me for going aboard a tribal class destroyer. It really didn't. Um, you don't realize just how big the size differential is. It's only a few hundred tons instead of, uh, instead of in terms of standard displacement, but it's a big differential in terms of size. And the way she's positioned, she is in a beautiful location. And that really does allow you to see her lines. And I won't discuss how cruiser-like they are, but it was looking at her from along the sort of wharf and sort of looking at that angle, and I was going... That profile, it just looks cruiser. It just screams cruiser. You can see it in the pictures. You see it from, but there's something about seeing it in person and just going, "Oh, you really do scream a cruiser." And as Frack liked to bring out the the potholes, the potholes really do sort of the portholes. I mean, the portholes they really do. So the the absence of the middle really do accentuate at night. This looks like a cruiser. In day, it looks like a cruiser. It is does look like an act. It looks like an acts like a cruiser in terms of its styling, and that's really something interesting to look at. And the size helps with that. Right, back to um, Age of Sail stuff. I recommended the wonderful Otto Malera 76 moment. USN probably has a truckload of them from the Scrapped Perry class and other ships. Unfortunately, the US don't. And the thing is, the reason I go with the 57 moment is because that's already on the Halifax class frigate. So therefore, I very much would be say uh, this is the consistent I would go. Again, people wonder why I go with the 40 millimeter for the Ariva class because we're already buying them for the Type 31s. So it's an already existing. There is no point with OPVs buying anything new or custom for them. No, it should all be stuff which is, this is stuff we already have for this program, that program. It's off our shelf. Not just off the shelf, it's off our shelf. We might have to buy more of them to outfit these units with them, but they're off our existing shelf, so they go all into existing pipelines. That is the way it goes. Duncan, Siege of Gibraltar, followed by the Siege of Lisbon, both supplied by the RN. And finished with the French getting mangled. Wonder if the French generals in Portugal saw the lines and thought, not this again. Um, to an extent, they realised that as long as the Royal Navy could supply the port could supply the places, they were going to be getting the supplies. And that's the thing. You can only really besiege something if you can cut off it from supplies. And if the Royal Navy is coming in with supplies, A... That's better than road supplies, and B, because of the quantities you get, and B, you're now in trouble. You can't complete a quarter siege.
I'm Zansky. What? Missile unification across the planet ship classes? No, no, no. Every ship should have her own unique set of missiles. And a helicopter. Different uh, heli type for each ship. Oh, good lord. There aren't simply facts you think of that. Now, philanthropy. I heard in the news a couple of days ago the American government is going to give Ukraine <laughs> harpoon anti ship missiles. Do you have any opinion about that? Um, if they are delivered and they're actually able to be used, that'd be good for them. They need extra missiles. They're probably running out of the things. 96831. Was it the plan to have all five Queen Elizabeths? To have a QE star refit. No, I think it was only four of them are going to have the QE star refit. War Spike, for starters, has their own different refit, so it would actually be free with the QE, but it was QE Valiant. And then I think. <sighs> Barham had had a mini refit. I think it's Malaya was going to have the full refit. But you must remember the plans were based on new ships entering service. And the whole point was the, uh, that you sort of at the same yards which could be doing the refit and the resources which you could be doing the refit could also be used for building new ships. So especially once you had the Vanguard program going alongside the King George of Fifths. And the whole idea had been to build some Vanguards whilst building, or Vanguard equivalents while building the King George of Fifths and then build the, carry on building the Vanguards while building the Lions. Um, you, you theoretically have... Well, you theoretically should have five capital ships entering service every sort of three years, two to three years, which would have, uh, theoretically, if the Royal Navy had managed to keep up that pace, would have allowed them, if they, let's say, going on to 1942, could have meant 10 new vessels in service, which would have probably meant pretty much all the unimproved vessels would have been out of service. So the R's would have probably all been gone, barring maybe Royal Oak. And the Queen Elizabeth, which hadn't been re updone, would have been gone. And, you know, you sort of, in that scenario, you're going, well, well, probably Repulse has gone. Um, Hood will have been upgraded. Sam Thompson, my favourite part of the hideout was us, was all of us getting a talking to about how we're going down ladders. You all got a talking to. They let me get away with it. Because I'd explained to them on the first day when I was there exactly where my background is and how, I'm how, how I've got the experience I have not going down ladders. And I went, you're going to annoy us, aren't you? Yes, but it's actually safe for me to do what I d uh, always do rather than for me to do your way because I, won't, I will overthink doing it your way. But you have to explain that to them first. Hmm. So, why I suggest the uh, round hole? Uh, 40 millimeters. The RCA uses their 120 millimeter guns and they have two tanks. There's a big difference between that, and it's honestly it's easier to go with the one which the Navy's already using, which is 57 millimeter. Although there is issues on it. Right. So we're sort of at the end. Uh, tomorrow, as said, there is brew ships. I'll go through my caps then. I realise Rack will be going through his caps now. And Dan has already done his cap video. Uh, I'm going to once again thank Mr. Benjamin Turon. That is. I know Brian does the designs, but Benjamin put it together. And it's just cool. It is really cool. Um, and yeah, the coins. I'm going to need to find a wallet for this one, I think, to protect it, because the others have all got little wallets. But, yeah, that's the Battle of the Antic. 
Royal Canadian Navy one. Really cool. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, Canada would not have happened without your support. Uh, our next trip will not happen without your support. It will be dependent entirely on your support. Um, as said, if for doing it off videos alone, it's not, econ not commercially or economically viable, even for Drac with his far, far greater numbers of subscribers than me. And I have now passed 8,000. So thank you very much, everyone, for letting me get past 8,000. 10,000 is still a target to wind up my art, but thank you. Um, but, yeah, it's commercially, it's it's wonderful doing these trips in terms of... No, well, not commercially. It's wonderful doing these trips in terms of history and what we can do to help the history and give attention to it. And it, it, seriously, the help we managed to do we could feel ourselves helping as we were going around. We could feel ourselves being of use, especially with the lives and the other discussions we did. And we hopefully that the recorded videos of all the footage will be of use. But, and I say this, it's not possible to do it without your support. It's not, Without the donations you put in in advance to help us pay for it, it would not have been possible. Because the videos... They're never going to make enough in advertising revenue, etc., to pay for the trips. Um, as much as we'd love them to, they won't. Well, I don't know. If both of us suddenly found ourselves on, I don't know... Mm, who? Probably if we were... If both of us suddenly were at the level of shadversity in terms of our numbers of subscribers and patrons and all of that, Maybe, maybe they'd be paying enough to pay for those strips. But if we consider what Shad's doing, I'm not sure. It's a lot of fun, and it's something I will never give up doing willingly, as long as I have the time. But those trips are not possible without you, without your generosity. Because it's your generosity that actually makes them, uh, makes them economically viable. So thank you for that. And we are going to get together when Gareth is back in the UK. We're going to sit down. We're going to have a chat, the four of us, and work out our next trip and work out what it will be. We have a preference. Uh, I have to admit, me and, me and Drac have a preference, but that's mainly because if we do a certain trip, we do get, me, we get Jamie as our fifth group, <laughs> a member of our group. Um... So we're hoping that one. But it's going to be, again, working out how much money. And again, we are going to be completely honest with all of you about how much it's going to cost. And we are going to work out various things. So suggestions for fundraising and suggestions for people I can write to for grant proposals for money be very good. Because I'm doing the search myself, but I always realize that I am one person with one set of contacts and one set of focus. And sometimes I will miss things or ignore things because I presume that they're not going to, so I'd focus my time elsewhere to try and be efficient. And that might mean I overlook things. So any ideas, gratefully received. Hmm. <laughs> I think, why did the war corgi keep her six inch casement guns when they should have been replaced by 4.5 45s? Uh, mainly because have you tried to tell the war corgi that she shouldn't have her six inch guns? Cosmos, do you think the sailing frigates warships during the Napoleon Wars reached the close to perfection? <sighs> they got really good. They got really pretty. Really, really pretty. Um, if we built on now, would it be rad radically different? No. Um, in fact, in the, when they were building Hermione, the amount of stuff they discovered, which was really, really, which they thought what they should do differently, and then when they tried to do differently, it didn't work. Um, so they went back. So after all, I know they have differences, just thinking about them being already being a supplier to the partnership is formed. We'll love the first room, as you said, but still need a 40 millimeter source. 
the formula of the unit of both of us is actually pretty good. And the thing is, with the the other option with the getting the 40 millimeter, if you were looking for that, is for example, the Royal Canadian Navy, as it's part of the British Type 26, Type 31 program, it hasn't been, isn't going to be officially on Type 26, but they are certainly being built with it in mind. And it's non deck penetrating. The both as 40 millimeter is actually quite a good idea because it can be a joint buy with the Brits. The War Corgi. The War Corgi is, uh, is Knight 6831's nickname for um, HMS War Spite. The... Well, as I've said before, a Corgi never understands that it's not as a big dog. A Corgi has no concept of, you are bigger than it, and a Corgi has no concept of, it will back down. Corgis, remember, are bred to heckle and push cattle, originally. They have no concept of the idea they are a small dog. None at all. And it's like, Warspite has no concept that she's in danger or she should be not there alive. No, no, no. She will keep fighting. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for all your support. And thank you. All right. And as said, there is going to be a little review going live at some point of this book. But you're going to enjoy Glenn Stewart's book. And yeah, enjoy yourselves. I watch track. Right, come, government, and as odd as it may sound to you, you should speak up, uh, speak to your local uh, and county councillors, and see what grants they have. Oh, I have. They're interesting souls. Remember, I did used to be a local borough councillor, so I know quite a lot of them and the county councillors. And I, unfortunately, I don't think they, they, they would grant money for these sort of things. Sadly. Take care. Hello, Dan. Dan. Keep the track awake and going for hours. That would be cruel. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Carl Gazbag. Thank you. Oh, thank you for the uh, super chat, Carl. Uh, thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Juicy Susan. Thank you, Stafford, Seneca Nero, Cosadranus, Knight6831. Thank you, Melanie6014, Matt Flattery. Um, thank you, Alzaski, Colin Cameron. Thank you, uh, Knight Heron Productions. Thank you, Peter Dawson. Thank you, oh, Saski, I think I said, Darius Rowski, Duckling95. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Depp Squad. Thank you, Paul from Chicago. Thank you, everyone who's been doing the chat supervision. Thank you, Rick Vigasava. Thank you, I think, DH89 and Colin Cameron. I think I said thank you, I'm not sure. Thank you, Stephen Richards. Thank you, Furry Kitten. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Strider. Uh, thank you, Tasha, too. And yeah, thank you, everyone. And DG40, thank you. Take care, have a nice evening, and um, yeah, thank you for watching. Magic moments, yada di da da. Oh, I brew. That was nice. Right. Oh, 
I haven't turned the mic off. Ah, well, hope everyone's good. Having fun. Take care. Bye.